morning, everybody. You know, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. I um, have been to China before, but I've never had the privilege to visit um, this city um, or this great medical university. So I, it's a real pleasure to be here and rather humbling to see so many of you, actually, I have to say. So um, thank you very much for coming. Um, let me see if this works, yes. I'm president of the Royal Society, that's why I put this up first. It's the oldest science academy in the world, 354 years old. Um, and it's one of the jobs I do, as you heard. Now, what I would like to do today is tell you some stories which describe how work in my laboratory led to or helped lead to understanding about how the reproduction of cells is controlled. And that was the major work that um, contributed to the Nobel Prize in 2001. And I want to explain why this is an important problem, both for biology and for medicine. And I also want to explain how a problem like this can be investigated even when very little is known about it when you start. I'd like you to get a sense of how science is done, and as you've heard, the importance of teamwork and collaboration, and the ups and downs in research, and also the luck in research. And I shall describe some of the luck that I had in doing this research. But it was also an exciting adventure for me, and I'd like to convey some of that excitement too. Now, I know that many of you um, come from mixed backgrounds. Not all of you are um, biological researchers. And so some parts may be a little difficult to follow. Um, other parts will perhaps be easier for some of you in the audience. So I'll, I must apologize for that. When I think something's a little difficult, I'll tell you, and then you can have a little sleep during that. <laughs> and I will wake you when we get to the end, OK? So you don't have to listen to some things that are a little difficult. The other thing I wanted to say before I start is I'm going to be describing work that started a long time ago in the 1970s and extended maybe for 20 years. And some of the things I had to do in the lab and my colleagues did with me are now very old-fashioned. And I want to point that out to you because what you can do today is so much more effective, so much more rapid, and I'd like you just to get a sense of that. I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about the history behind the problem that I've been investigated. And the problem I'm going to talk about is how is the reproduction of cells controlled? So that's going to be my topic today. I want to start 350 years ago with the discovery of the cell. The discovery of the cell was made by a scientist called Robert Hooke. He was one of the founders of the Royal Society. It was described in 1665, and it was described in the city of Oxford, where I have my house. And he used a very simple microscope. You see a picture of it there um, on the left. And what he did is he took a razor, a sharp knife, and he cut through some cork, through plant material, looked at it under this microscope, and drew this picture here on the right. And you can see these little boxes, and they reminded him of the plan of a monastery, of monks' cells, and so he called them cells. And that's the origin of the word cell. And this is the um, discovery of the cell that you see here as the basic unit of life. This is the basic structural unit, and over uh, the years after this discovery in 1665, 
it became clear that this was the basic, the cell is the basic physiological unit, the simplest um, entity that um, reflects the properties of life. And this was well stated by the German pathologist Rudolf Virchow. And I have a quotation here from um, a book he wrote in 1858, where he said, every animal appears as a sum of vital units, each of which bears in itself the complete characteristics of life. What does that mean? What it means is that the cell exhibits the characteristics of life. And if you want to understand how life works, the cell is a very good place to start. The second thing he stated, which is important for today's talk, um, is, um, and he, he said this in Latin, omnis cellula acellula, and what that means is all cells come from cells. That is, that the, a cell comes when, um, uh, from other cells which divide from one to two. And that is really the process that um, I want to describe today. And this is a dividing mammalian fibroblast cells, which has just completed the process we call the cell cycle. The cell cycle being the series of events that have to occur before a cell can um, reproduce itself. So why is this process, the cell cycle, cell reproduction, why is it important? There's three reasons I want to briefly describe. One is it's the basis of all growth and reproduction. The second is that it links the molecular process of DNA replication, um, uh, first uh, uh, suggested by uh, Watson and Crick in 1953, and thirdly, it's important for disease. In particular, it's important for cancer. So let's just go quickly through those three things. The first is it's the basis of all growth and reproduction. Um, when, uh, for example, um, an, an animal is formed from fertilization of an egg, it's a single cell that undergoes repeated cell divisions going through the cell cycle to form a bag of cells which then differentiate into an embryo. And you can see a mouse embryo over here, and you may just see a few spots there, which are the different cells. That starts from a single cell, and here we have a picture of a mammalian cell, um, an egg being fertilized by sperm. And I want to tell you that every one of you in this room, and there's a lot of you, once looked like this. <laughs> Every single one of us in this room looked like this, and if you're not interested, it's time to leave, because um, this, is the, um, this is really the key fact. We all were once a single cell. The second is this linkage. The second reason for being interested is the linkage of the copying of DNA, which is a chemical process, to the reproduction of the cell, which is a cellular and biological process, a linkage of the molecules of chemistry with biology. And you see that here. This is the cell cycle. And um, the cell cycle, as I've said, is the process uh, by which cells reproduce themselves. And key to that is the replication of DNA in the chromosomes and the segregation of those chromosomes into two newly divided cells. So when a cell is born, there is a gap called G1, where, during which the cell prepares itself for DNA replication. And that blue bar up there is a replicating chromosome. That occurs during S phase, called S, and then during G2, the cell is preparing itself for mitosis when the replicated chromosomes separate or segregate into the two newly divided cells, and that forms the beginning of the next cell cycle. So that's the second reason this process is important. The third is it's relevant for cancer. Cancer is a consequence of uncontrolled cell division. What I've illustrated here with those blue boxes is a layer of cells, let's say epithelial cells, which are controlled. They're not misbehaving. Then one of those cells, the one that is red, 
becomes damaged, the genes become damaged in that cell, and it goes out of control. So it now begins to copy and replicate itself in an uncontrolled fashion, and we see all these red boxes appearing, which is the beginning of a cancer. So cell reproduction is the basis of cancer, and it's also related to the cause of cancer, because cancer is a consequence of damage to DNA, and um, this can occur due to malfunctions during the cell cycle. So this whole process of cell reproduction is very, very important um, for um, understanding um, cancer. Now, the questions I wanted to ask, and I'm going to explain the history behind this, is how can cell reproduction be controlled? And I do want to emphasize the word controlled, not described, but controlled. What regulates it? And then secondly, which will be obvious in my talk, is how can this be investigated? And this is work which I carried out um, mainly in um, the United Kingdom, in, in England and Scotland, um, a, a little bit also in Switzerland. But the main work was done in London, in these laboratories here, which um, are now Cancer Research UK. And my laboratory is still in this building here. But actually, I don't know if I can... The, most of this work, one, two, three, it was done in these, these lab here, these three bays here. <laughs> now I've been relegated to the back of the building, but um, then I was in the front of the building. So that's where um, the most important work was, um, that's when the most important work was done. Now I want to start by saying, look, if you were interested in a biological phenomenon like cell reproduction, how can you investigate it? How can you investigate what is important for reproduction when you know nothing about it? And that's the starting point of my study. And what's uh, the, uh, a very powerful approach that you can use is to use genetics. And I'm going to explain the principle that was used, and then I'm going to explain the practice of um, how it was employed. Now, the genetic approach is this. You, uh, if you're interested in something like cell reproduction, the cell cycle, you have to choose a model system to work with. I chose a single-celled um, organism, a micro microbe called yeast, called the fission yeast. I'm going to show you some pictures of that in a moment. And what you do, and this box here represents yeast, is you mutagenize it. In my case, I did it with a, 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 a mutagen, a chemical mutagen. And those, uh, that mutagen will damage the genes. You can see the genes up there, which are um, looking green here. And um, if you damage um, uh, the genes and you uh, damage them randomly, you can see one there that I've damaged in red. So you take a, a population of cells, you treat them with a mutagen, and then you look for mutated cells that are behaving differently from normal cells, from wild-type cells, in a way that is interesting with respect to the problem that you want to study. In my case, it was the cell cycle, and I'll give you an example of a, a behavior which is illuminating about that. So normally, the fission yeast cells look like the, the, the are up there, the top boxes I can just show you here, and the cells are growing and dividing. And what I looked for were mutants which couldn't complete the cell reproductive process. And because they couldn't complete it, what would happen is they wouldn't be able to divide and they could continue to grow. So they produced these long elongated rods or sausages um, because they could continue to grow, but they couldn't divide. This is very simple. This is not complicated. It's very simple. But what that allowed you to do was to identify the, the, the red genes, the damaged genes, that were important for cell reproduction. And I'll say something um, about that in a moment. So that's the approach. Random mutagenesis, you don't know anything about it. You imagine what a gene would uh, behave like if damaged, if it was important for the cell cycle. Then you look for them and you discover genes that are important for the process. Now, what was the organism? The organism was fission yeast. 
Um, and this is a, a scanning electron micrograph of it. This is actually the first picture I can find of fission yeast. It was made in the Carlsberg Brewery in Copenhagen, um, where um, the brewer there was describing yeast that contaminated the brewing process. He didn't like fission yeast. And this is a simple organism that I've worked on um, now for uh, over 40 years. It has only 5,000 genes. We have around 25,000 genes. My lab um, was responsible for sequencing it. Um, it was the fourth eukaryote sequenced, so very early on. And um, since that time, we've also deleted every one of these genes. So we now have a collection of 5,000 strains, each of which have one gene deleted. It's the most highly um, uh, uh, um, deleted organism, actually, um, eukaryote, um, that, we, that we know. So I can now study the effect of each one of those genes. But that's what we do today. And it's not, um, it, it, uh, w when I started working on it, of course, we knew no nothing about this. Um, I started the project in the following way. I was carrying out a PhD project, and I was measuring the um, content of amino acids in um, plants and in fungi. And I have to tell you, it was an extremely boring project. <laughs> now, every graduate student thinks their project is boring, um, or not always, but quite often, <laughs> and because um, it is boring sometimes. In my case, it really was true. It was actually quite boring. Now, I had to analyze um, the amino acids. I used a newly invented machine called an amino acid analyzer, and this was made by Beckman, and my university, which was in England, was fortunate, or perhaps unfortunate, to have one of these machines. It was a prototype machine, and the point about prototype machines is that they don't work properly. And I had this machine in the lab, and it didn't work primarily because it had too many safety devices in the machine. It was using liquid chromatography, and it measured the pressure of the liquid at all different stages during the process. And if the pressure got too high, it would switch itself off. It took two hours and 42 minutes to run a whole amino acid analyze, analysis. And if it switched itself off at two hours and 41 minutes, or any time before, it threw all the data away, just threw it away. So this was very frustrating because the safety device would switch it off about once every two runs and it would throw all the data away. So to get over this problem as a graduate student, I went through the machine and inactivated all the safety devices one at a time using little pieces of metal, paper clips, or glue, or um, blue tack until I had a machine that would work, but was extremely dangerous, because the pressure kept building up. So to work it, I had to sit with it and watch the pressure gauge. Okay? And I operated it at twice the safe level, um, but just before it blew up, um, I would have to switch it off. Okay? I'm sure you don't believe this, but it's all perfectly true. So this meant that when I sat with the machine, I used to read a lot, because I'd have to sit with it for two hours and 42 minutes. So what I would do is, look, I'd have the paper like this here, yes? And the dial would be here, and my finger would be over the button here, and I would read papers, and if the needle went like this, I'd hit the stop button, okay? <laughs> now, why is this relevant? It's relevant, because one thing that happens with graduate students is that Although, in my case, I photocopied papers, in your case, you will download PDF files, yes? You don't actually read them most of the time. You just download the files, <laughs> and they accumulate, and you don't read them. You see, you're smiling at me. It's true, isn't it? You don't actually read them. And in this case, because I had so much time, two hours and 42 minutes with each run, I read all these papers, you know? I recommend you read the papers, actually. Don't just download them. Read them. It's quite, um, quite useful. And 
Um, as a consequence of this, I read some papers um, which had been carried out by Lee Hartwell, who, working with budding yeast, had started isolating mutants in genes that were important for the cell cycle, called CDC genes. And I thought it would be very good to do this um, using fission yeast, which divided equally in two rather than budded. But the problem was I was a biochemist, I didn't know genetics, and I didn't know cell biology. So I had to learn it. And I went and spent um, some time with two of my supervisors. Um, first of all, with Urs Leopold, who worked in Switzerland, in Bern. Can you see this alpine horn? We gave it to him on his 60th birthday. That's his 60th birthday. It, it's what they use to call the cows, I think, in Switzerland, when they want to milk them. And um, this is his 60th birthday. And he taught me genetics. I stayed with him for nearly a year, and he taught me genetics. Then I moved to Edinburgh. And you'll see, can you see this is um, clearly Scotland. Can you see this um, it's kilt here? And um, this was my boss there, Murdoch Mitchison. And he taught me cell biology. And I worked in both of these labs for seven years. I published. I forget, 15 or maybe 17 papers. And what I want to tell you is they did not put their name on any paper I wrote because they didn't think they contributed enough to justify um, authorship. They, of course, did a great deal for me. They deserved it, but they were trying to help and support me. And I, I want to, even now, they're both dead now, acknowledge their, um, their generosity. One other thing. This is my wife here. I was, um, and what she says here, you see everybody's doing the washing up. It was after a party in the lab. She's doing the washing up. And she always says when she sees this photograph, everybody's washing up, but can we see Paul? No. <laughs> Nowhere to be seen. It's very true. I don't like washing up, actually. Not at all. OK. Now. What did I do? How did I isolate these mutants? Now, I'm going to describe it with this cartoon. And by the way, what I'm showing you here is all the pictures I drew at the time. So this is a picture from 1976 or 77, something like this, 30, 40 years old. And I want to show it here. This is a cell, a diagram of cells increasing in mass versus time. Right? This is a normal cell. It grows through the cycle undergoes S phase, mitosis, cell division, divides, and goes back again to the normal size, right? Now, imagine what would happen if a gene which is necessary for cell division is defective. What would happen is that this cell would be unable to divide, but could continue to grow, so it would produce a cell that looked like this. And we call it a CDC mutant. And what I could do is mutagenize the cells and look amongst the colonies that were formed, um, which would generate cells that looked like this. Because this is lethal, it, 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 the cells can't divide, I had to look for temperature-sensitive mutants that would grow normally at one temperature, a low temperature, and would generate this phenotype at a high temperature. So that's what I did. And in a sense, it was very similar to what um, Lee Hartwell had done in budding yeast. He didn't look for increase in size. I did that. And I'll show you what some of these look like. This is a paper I published in 1976. This is a wild-type fission yeast. These are several mutants that uh, um, I isolated. This is involved, in fact, in DNA replication, and this one in mitosis, or the onset of mitosis. And you can see how they get highly elongated but can't divide. At this time, I isolated enough mutants to define 30 genes, 30 cell division cycle genes. I now know because I told you we've deleted all of the 5,000 genes in fission yeast, I now know there are about 300 genes that are required for the cell cycle. So at this point, we'd identified maybe 10% of the genes that were required. At this time, of course, I didn't know how many there were. I didn't even know how many genes there were in fission yeast. Nobody knew. It required us to sequence it later. Um, several people helped me with this study. Kim Naismith was a graduate student who I supervised in my lab. Pierre Turio, I will show you a picture of him a little later. Now, what did this show? What this showed was this. It identified genes 
that were necessary for the reproduction of cells. And that's a start for this project. But if you remember, I wanted to know how the cell cycle was controlled. I wasn't actually interested in simply describing all the processes needed for the cell cycle. I was interested in a specific problem, how were they controlled? So how could we isolate um, mutants that would define genes that were controlling? Well, I'm going to go back to this diagram here and tell you the approach that worked. Now, the first thing you have to think about is have a thought experiment, really. You have to think, um, what do I mean by control? And control means different sorts of things in actual fact. And I'm going to talk about two different sort of controls during, um, my, um, during my talk. But the first is this. A control is something which determines the rate at which a process occurs. It's rate limiting for progression through the cell cycle. If it's rate limiting, then what that means is it determines how long it takes for a cell to reproduce itself. And it, you do not have to have a rate-limiting step in the cell cycle, but if it exists, it will clearly be a control. If it exists, how could we identify it? Well, look back to here. Here's our normal cell, do you remember, growing through the cycle and then dividing. Now imagine that you get a mutant which allows the reproductive process to occur much more rapidly than normal because that mutant defines a rate-limiting step. If that exists, then the cell will be able to divide more rapidly than normal. It doesn't take all this time. Let's say, because it's exaggerated here, it can occur quickly. Um, then what will happen is it will divide at a small size, because it will divide before it has time to grow to the normal size. Once again, very simple. You know, this isn't rocket science. This is very simple. You just have to think about it. Just think about it. So. Looking for mutants like this would identify rate-limiting steps. So here's the first mutant that was identified. And you'll see here's a wild-type cell. And this is a mutant. I called it a wee mutant um, because wee is a Scottish word for small. You may know that. And um, this is clearly a small size mutant. And I published this. I told you I, I was a single author because my supervisor wouldn't go on it in 1975. Now, I'd like to tell you that I had had the thought to look for wee mutants and then went and hunted for them, but I didn't. I simply was looking for cell division cycle mutants, ones that looked like this, under the microscope, and then I saw a colony of cells that looked like this. So it wasn't that I thought about it, it's just that I saw it and then interpreted what it meant. And why I mention that is, is that in biology, it's very important to be open to what nature gives you. Because nature can lead you in directions which you can't imagine otherwise. And so nobody had thought of looking for these mutants. And it was only when I saw it that I realized that this probably meant that it was defining a rate-limiting step in the cell cycle. So in thinking about this, I was helped by a friend and colleague, Peter Fantis, shown here. And what was lucky about this is that this mutant was temperature sensitive. That meant at low temperature, it looked like this. At high temperature, it looked like this. And so what we had was a gene which was rate limiting for a step, but was only rate limiting at the high temperature is when, it, when, when you lost activity. So this meant that if I shifted it from the low temperature to the high temperature, if this function acted um, late in the cell cycle, then cells would change, rapidly change the size at which they divided. If it happened early in the cycle, it would take a whole cell cycle before that happened. Do you see it? You, you see that? So um, here is such an experiment. I shift it up at time zero, and cells start to divide at a small size um, within about half an hour to 45 minutes of shifting up. So that told me that this function was occurring towards the end of the cell cycle. And indeed, when I um, uh, worked out the timing, it was clear that it occurred at the end of G2, just before the onset of mitosis. 
Now, I want you to pause and think what these very, very simple experiments um, revealed. Firstly, it revealed that the cell cycle does have rate-limiting steps. I told you it doesn't have to, but it does. The second thing it revealed is it identified one of the genes involved in that rate-limiting step, and that was called WE1. And the third thing it revealed is that that gene acted in G2 and determined the timing of the onset of mitosis. So it was a rate-limiting step for the whole cell cycle, and it worked in G2 for the onset of mitosis. So you can conclude quite a lot from very simple experiments should you actually think carefully about what they actually mean. Now, um, I was excited by that, and I thought I better isolate more mutants that looked like this. They're not easy to isolate because there's no way to get them. You just have to visually screen them. And I spent um, one year isolating 50 such mutants by visual microscopy. So quite a, quite a, lot, of, um, quite a lot of work. Um, when I isolated them, I asked, do they map to the same gene? And they nearly always map to WE1. And I want to tell you a little bit about that. I set myself the target of getting 50 mutants to see how many genes that I could identify. And um, I got to mutant 48, and they all mapped to the same gene, WE1. So the only gene I could identify was WE1. The 49th, I isolated on a plate, and it was covered with a fungus, filamentous fungus. I don't know if any of you have worked with that, but that is the kiss of death for a microbiologist because it just spreads everywhere. I was tired. It was a Friday evening. It was raining. It was cold. Not quite as cold as here, though, I have to say. <laughs> um, and I was um, decided that I would throw it away in the rubbish and go home. I threw it into the rubbish. I went home. I had my tea. And then I felt guilty. I felt of my little mutant there in the rubbish. And after a couple of hours, I had to get back on my bicycle and cycle back and take it out of the rubbish. We didn't use to clean up very quickly. In, um, it was in Scotland at that time. So it was still there. And then I micro-dissected it away, and I took some fungus with it, and it got contaminated. And two weeks later, I managed to get the... Um, the thing isolated and pure. And, of course, as you perhaps guessed, that was the only mutant that didn't define WE1. It defined a second gene, which I called WE2. So after this series of studies, which I did, incidentally, um, I'm going to show you a picture of, of me, actually. Can you see? That's me. Can you believe that? <laughs> I had hair once, had color, you know? <laughs> quite long, too, and I had a moustache. You see that there? You know? And this is my friend Pierre Thurio. This is just after hippie times, you know? You can imagine, right? And as usual, I'm speaking. You can see here. And um, so what we had at this stage was 49 mutants that were in WE1 and one mutant in WE2. Now, what does that mean? The fact that it is so common in WE1 suggests, actually, that WE1 encodes an inhibitor of the control because it's easy to knock it out. You know, if you, if you mutate it and destroy the function, you get advanced into mitosis. The fact that WE2 was rare suggests that it's a positive function. That is to say, it's required for mitosis, but the mutation makes the process go more rapidly than normal. So we'd say that's positive. Did you get that? Yeah? Negative? and positive. Shall I say it again? Or is that, nod if you got it. I'm going to say it again. Not many people nodded, OK? Just imagine that if you randomly mutagenize the genes, it's much easier to destroy a gene than make it work more effectively. So much more common is to isolate a mutants that have a loss of function. And that's why if you have 49 out of 50, they're likely to be a loss of function. So from that study, we concluded that WE1 included an inhibitor and um, WE2 an activator. I did some more experiments. I'm not going to describe them here, which showed that uh, some of the mutations, or one of them, was a nonsense mutant, which is also a loss of function. But I, I won't describe that um, today. 
Now, if we too was positive, so we're starting again. Do apologize for that. If we too was positive acting, can you imagine what it would look like if we knocked it out? And what it would look like is one of those CDC mutants, okay? Because it was required for the cell cycle. So I then looked to see whether we too mapped to any of those CDC genes that we'd first identified. And I was lucky. We too ended up being mapped to the CDC2 gene. Do you see that here? It was very tightly linked. So this meant at this point that um, I had two genes, we one and CDC2. And CDC2 could be mutated in two ways. If it was active, you went into mitosis early. If it was inactive, you didn't go into mitosis at all. Okay? So that, that's where we were. Now, back to my other story. Okay? I thought this was exciting. Nobody else did. I thought we should then look at the controls acting at the G1 to S transition. So how could we get to that? Well, this is a different experiment I did with my technician, Yvonne Bissett. Now, we have the cell cycle, and the question is, what starts the cell cycle? This is something Lee Hartwell had discussed. And uh, what he suggested and what I was following here was that what you could do is you could block cells at different stages of the cell cycle and ask, can they undergo a different alternative developmental pathway to the cell cycle? And the one thing that yeast can do is conjugate with another yeast. And that's a different developmental pathway. So it's a very simple experiment again. Um, you block cells at different stages and ask, can they conjugate? Did those experiments and found that only if you blocked in G1, and a typical example was a mutant in CDC10, could you conjugate. If you blocked any time in S phase or G2 or M, you couldn't conjugate. So that suggested there was a control where you became committed to the mitotic cycle. And I was, uh, this, was, this was good, so I'd identified the control, defined it by CDC10, and there was a point of decision. So that's another control that occurs there in G1. The problem was um, that I did a control experiment. And controls, of course, you have to worry about controls. And my control experiment was CDC2. Because CDC2 was my most studied gene and it blocked at G2. So that should give very low levels of conjugation, you see here from CDC2. Now, uh, if you got good levels of conjugation compared with um, normal cells, that would be 100%. If you got poor levels, you'd get 5%. But with the case of CDC2, I expected 5% or less, but I got 20%. Now, I couldn't make 20% less than 5%. You know, it doesn't fit, OK? So that meant that cells being blocked here seemed to be conjugating some of the time. So that worried me. So I did the experiment again. I got 20%. Then I tested, I tested the temperature of the water bath. Set it very accurately. I got 20%. Then I bought a more accurate thermometer and tested the temperature of the water bath. And I got 20%. Then I got depressed and put the experiments away and repeated it a month later and got 20%. And then I had a dream. <laughs> and in my dream, I woke and I had an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other. And the devil was speaking into this ear. And what the devil was saying was this. He says, look, you've got a whole paper here Everything works except the result with CDC2. But you know something? The only person in the world who knows you've done that experiment with CDC2 is you. So actually, you could forget that experiment, write up everything else, and it would all fit. And you could say there's a start control, commitment control, acts in G1, and um, all the other things fit and nobody really is paid too much attention to what you've done before and they won't notice the fact that you don't mention CDC2. And then you'll be able to apply for a job and people will be interested in it because it's a commitment control and you'll get a lecturing job and a, you know, an every, a professor's job and everything will be fine. The angel was on the other shoulder 
And the angel said, you can't do that, Paul. <laughs> he said, the pursuit of science is the pursuit of truth. And you can't not present that data. Now, I know if you do, it'll be rejected by those horrible reviewers who review your papers, and you'll never get it published. And I know if you don't get it published, that means you won't get a job. And I know if you don't get a job, you won't be able to pay the rent on your flat. And I know that means you'll be thrown out into the street and your children will starve. But science is the pursuit of truth. I woke up in a cold sweat. And I thought, there has to be another way, a third way. And the third way was, what if 20% was right? Because you have to understand, for the previous three months, I thought 20% was wrong. I was looking for an answer which was less than 5%. Okay? So then I went away and thought, well, how could we explain 20%? And eventually, one or two days later, I came up with this explanation. Maybe, um, if we look at the cell cycle here, the G1 is rather short. Maybe CDC2 functions not only at G2M, which I knew all about, but also at G1S. But because when I shifted to the high temperature, most cells accumulated here, I thought it was a G2 block. But if 20% of the cells blocked here, because they were between here and here, they would be able to conjugate. I'd never thought of that in the previous two or three months, because I was constantly thinking the result was wrong. Okay? And um, to test that, I could synchronize cells here. And when I did that, they all blocked here. They couldn't undergo DNA synthesis and I got 100% conjugation. So what did that mean? What it meant was that CDC2 is not only required at G2 to M, where it's the major rate-limiting step of the cell cycle, but is also required at G1 to S, where it starts the cell cycle and is the point where the cell becomes committed. So I realized CDC2 was the master regulator of the cell cycle. But you'll appreciate that this is all genetics and physiology. And the reason for that is this was done before DNA cloning. Um, this is um, uh, um, PC, pre-cloning. Um, I don't think you can imagine that, actually, but it used to exist, you know, um, pre-cloning. But uh, just at that time, um, DNA cloning was just beginning to be um, carried out. It was about 1980. So I stopped my lab working on the cell cycle and started it working on molecular genetics in fission yeast, um, making DNA libraries, making a vector that could be transformed into fission yeast. Um, I think that was a, a, a paper here that I, I published um, with my postdoc, David Beach, um, to get high levels of transformation of fission yeast, um, isolating promoters and making gene libraries so that I could do molecular genetics. And as a consequence of that, I began to clone the cell cycle genes, again, Beach and Durkacz, who were working with me. And the first gene I cloned, of course, was CDC2. How did we clone it? We cloned it by what we call complementation. And this is going to occur later in my talk in a moment. This is a fission yeast cell. It's defective in CDC2. The cells can't divide. I took a gene library, which is made up of uh, DNA fragments of, 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 of fission yeast, um, one of which will contain the CDC2 gene. If a cell takes up the CDC2 gene, then that will provide active protein that will allow these cells now to grow and divide. They will form a colony on the plate. These will not. You can isolate the plasmid back again and clone the gene. That's cloning by complementation. So that's how I cloned CDC2. You then have to do some more experiments to show it integrates at this site to show that it's the right gene. So once you've cloned the gene, what can you do? Well, you can sequence it. But this was very early on, and the fragment I had was two kilobases long, very short, and it took us one year and three months to sequence it, 15 months to sequence it. Now in a sequencing machine, you can do it in 15 seconds. But it took us 15 months to do in um, the 19, early 1980s. So once I had the sequence, what could you do with it? You could compare it with other sequences, agreed? Yeah? How many sequences do you think were in the database of all organisms? There were 50. 
just 50. And most of those were cytochrome C, by the way, actually. Um, uh, because, um, so there was almost no data. But the one gene that CDC2 um, showed some sequence similarity to was a, um, a oncogene in the SARC virus called PP60, which was speculated to be a protein kinase. Protein kinases, of course, put phosphates onto other proteins and change their function. I've just demonstrated that here, that um, a protein kinase will phosphorylate other substrates, and that will change the structure of the protein, so you have different, um, um, different characteristics. So I thought that maybe CDC2 encoded a protein kinase. How do you prove it? Well, I took the gene, expressed it in bacteria, purified the protein, put it into a rabbit, made antibodies, and then we could immune precipitate um, the CDC2 protein out of cells. And um, I wanted to see whether it was a protein kinase, so I bought about 50 substrates from the Sigma catalog and added radioactive P32 to the immune precipitate and looked to see if any of them became phosphorylated, and one did, casein, a milk protein. And um, this shows protein kinase activity using that protein. Um, this was um, done by a postdoc in my lab, Viesta Simanis, done in London. And I made an extract from a temperature-sensitive mutant of CDC2. This is a critical experiment. A temperature-sensitive mutant of CDC2. And now, this activity was temperature-sensitive in vitro. And since the only difference between wild type and this strain was the temperature-sensitive mutant in CDC2, that meant that the activity I was measuring was encoded by CDC2. So even though the antibody wasn't that brilliant, that could show that it was, in fact, a protein kinase. This is me again, looking crazy, of course. <laughs> and this is Sergio Moreno, who uh, made a synchronous culture and measured protein kinase activity using this assay from over here, three years later now, um, to show that the protein kinase went up to a peak just as cells went into mitosis. So we now had a model, a molecular model. We now knew we had a rate-limiting step for the cell cycle. It worked in G2 and determined when mitosis was initiated. There were two genes that acted there, CDC2 and we one and that CDC2 encoded a protein kinase, and that protein kinase is activated to bring about mitosis. So we'd made quite a lot of um, progress. What was we one doing? Well, Paul Russell, who was in my lab um, as a postdoc, cloned we one sequenced it, and showed it was also a protein kinase. And so we speculated that we one was phosphorylating CDC2 to inhibit it, so if you del delete we one then CDC2 is activated early. We also showed genetically that CDC25 countered the activity of we one so we speculated that CDC25 might be a phosphatase and was taking off the phosphate that um, we one was, um, was putting on. And when we first isolated it, um, there were no phosphatase sequences known, so we could only speculate it, uh, that that was the, um, that was the case. To test that model, Kathy Gould, another postdoc in my lab, 1989 now, um, she did a, a phosphorylation analysis of the CDC2 protein, showed that it was phosphorylated on only two sites, one of them was a phosphotyrosine, and she showed that that phosphotyrosine, which is in the active site of the enzyme, was phosphorylated by we one So what we could speculate was that CDC2 was inhibited by we one phosphorylating in the active site and preventing kinase activity. So we now had a nice um, molecular explanation for what controlled the onset of mitosis. One other gene, and I'm going through this quite rapidly now, one other gene which, um, which genetically interacted with CDC2 was CDC13, and this was cloned by my graduate student Ian Hagen, and when he sequenced it, it turned out to be similar to a molecule that was being worked on um, by my colleague Tim Hunt, who worked in the same institute as me, and um, called Cyclin. So we speculated that CDC13 was part of this complex, and now we had this model. 
the rate limiting step of the onset of mitosis was catalyzed by the CDC2 protein kinase complex with CDC13. It was inhibited by We1 and activated by CDC25. Now, this was all in yeast. And I'm interested in yeast, but I have to tell you, not many other people are really interested in yeast. So the question was, does this control also operate in, for example, human beings, in us? And to do that, we had to try and isolate um, the um, uh, human gene. Now, how could we do that? This is before the humans were sequenced. We didn't have the human genome sequenced, so we couldn't do that. So the way that you could do it is two ways. You could take the um, yeast gene and try and hybridize it back to the human genome to look for hybridization by sudden blotting. Or you could express the CDC2 gene, you could express genes from, um, um, from humans and use antibody to see whether you could detect the protein. Um, we did both of those things, and uh, I'm going to show you a picture of the person in my lab who did it, Melanie Lee, in a moment. And over a, a period of one or two years, she isolated human protein kinases, but we had no idea whether they were the right one, because there's at least 500 human protein kinases. So we, it was very frustrating. Because do remember, humans and yeast diverged apart at least 1 billion years ago and probably 1.5 billion years ago. And to put that in context, dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago only. This is 20 times longer, 20 times older than the extinction of dinosaurs. So um, we failed. And then we thought we would try this approach, the one I just showed you, of cloning by complementation. But instead of using a fission yeast gene library, we used a human gene library. So instead of looking for the human gene by structural similarity, we were looking um, for it by um, um, functional identity. And when that experiment was done, and we got a cDNA library, the only one in the world, made by Paul Berg, we pulled out a human gene. I was enormously excited, enormously excited. And um, we had a colony on the plate which contained the CDC2 gene. It took us a couple of months to sequence it. And then it came off the computer. This is Melanie Lee, who was working in my lab. And amazingly, um, the human gene was 61% identical to the, um, uh, to the yeast and human genes, were 61% identical. So despite 1 to 1.5 million years of divergence, they were exactly the same. This is actually the first yeast cell growing with a human gene. And this was, um, we then cloned a number of genes from budding yeast, human, mouse, chicken, fly, and then plants to show they all contain exactly the same gene. So at this point, we could conclude that it was exactly the same control that worked from humans to yeast. So it was a highly conserved mechanism. One more experiment, and then I will finish. Um, what this showed you was that CDC2 controlled the onset of mitosis and also the onset of S phase. And I'm going to show you it also ensures that there's only one S phase per cell cycle. This is also key for the cell cycle. And we discovered this by looking for mutants that would um, undergo replication from G2, so you'd increase ploidy. We found, to our surprise, that that revealed certain mutations in CDC13, the cyclin component of CDC2 that acts at mitosis. And um, this um, led us to do an experiment, Jackie Hales, I'll show you a picture of her in a moment, where we switched off cyclin. This is the DNA content and um, here we have a 2C DNA content, but as soon as we switched off that cyclin, we went to 4C, to 8C, to 16C, 32C, 64C, and we produced these gigantic nuclei. These are stained for DNA compared with wild type. And our explanation, this is Jackie over here, was quite simple. The CDC2 complex with CDC13 prepares the cell for mitosis. That's the legitimate event for a G2 cell and it also inhibits the onset of S phase. 
so that once you've completed S phase, you cannot undergo another S phase till you've completed mitosis. If you eliminate that cyclin, the cells get into G2, they can't undergo mitosis, they can't inhibit S phase, so you undergo repeated rounds of DNA replication. So that led to this model, where, which is a very simple model of how the eukaryotic cell cycle is regulated. That is, that it's all controlled by CDK activity. You start with low activity, you get um, or, uh, an increase in activity, you undergo S phase, you get more activity and you block S phase, you get yet more activity and you undergo mitosis, then you degrade the cycling and the cell cycle starts all over again. And you cannot imagine really a simpler model. So that's uh, summarized here. CDK controls the cell cycle, controlling onset of S phase, inhibiting S phase, and then onset of mitosis. And this control is the same in all eukaryotes. Should we have been surprised at this result of the conservation? Most people were, but I'm going to finish with one last slide, which is a quotation from Theodore Schwann in 1839, who was um, one of the um, people who explained the cell theory. I just want to read it. We have seen that all organisms are composed of essentially like parts, namely of cells. That's the cell theory, right? that these cells are formed and grow in accordance with essentially the same laws, hence that these processes must everywhere result from the operation of the same forces. In other words, what Schwann was arguing is that this whole process is conserved in all living cells. It just took us another 150 years to show it was true. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, so uh, I can, let's start with you. Uh, I'm just, uh, I got two questions. Yes, but one at a time. First question. Yeah, well, first I just want to make a comment is that the first graduate student you mentioned, Kim Nesmans, yes. was actually the head of the department of chemistry when, in Oxford when I was studying there. Ah, yes. He, yeah, he, so, he, yeah. yeah, so all the people in your labs really now um, leaders <laughs> in the fields. He's yeah. still there, in fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, one question I want to ask is that uh, how did you persuade pers pers your supervisor when you were studying and when you were trying to sequencing the amino acids to change your um, field into studying the fishing yeast? Well, I, I think I explained to you how I had these two very good supervisors yeah. Yeah. Um, who I did my work with, and neither of them, um, Earth Leopold had never thought about the cell cycle, and Murdoch Mitchison had never thought about genetics. But when I went to speak to both of them, they thought this was a good idea. And they said, uh, we couldn't do it, but if you learn genetics with one and cell cycle with the other, then we're happy to do it. So that's exactly what happened. I just persuaded them that it was a good idea. Yeah, that's really great supervisors. I think some, not all the supervisors are happy for their most students. Are not. To oh, yeah, most yeah. are not. Yeah. So the second question is that, because we all know, as you said, that cells are the really basic physiological unit of yeah. the life. Yeah. And uh, for a long time, we don't think that people can synthesize all the m many molecules, proteins, uh, DNAs, but nobody thinks that we could, um, the cells could be synthesized. But a few years ago, there's a paper pu published in Science saying that the cells, a bacterial cell, can be synthesized. What do you think of that discovery to, to, to humans? I think you're thinking of Craig Venter, and yeah. I, I don't think he really synthesized it at all, to be quite honest. I think it was um, very exaggerated in the media. What he, of course, did was simply um, synthesize the DNA of the chromosome, which he already knew, and then put it back into a, a cell that was already alive, where he'd killed the genome. So I think it was a hugely exaggerated um, uh, project. It was, of course, a technical tour de force to sequence to synthesize such a large piece of DNA. So Craig did a very good technical job in um, synthesizing the DNA, but he in no way synthesized life. That's just nonsense. So you still don't think that it's possible for us to, for him to I, synthesize I think, I think what you can do, is, which is what Craig argued, is that you can now engineer a little bit more, but notice nothing's been engineered since he published it. So I don't think really it was effective at that either. Okay, another question. 
Who else would like to ask a question? One here, I think. Okay. Hello. <laughs> uh, it's a great honor for me to have a, to have a question for you. Uh, I'm wondering uh, when you enjoyed your cell cycle research and revealed that uh, CDC2 is a critical regulator of cell cycle progression, have you realized that uh, this work will be a milestone in the future and uh, consider that you could become a Nobel laureate? Ah, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so the question, just in case you didn't hear, was um, I guess when did I realize it might become a Nobel Prize? <laughs> well, you know, when I started this work, I was just interested in it for its own sake, so I had no idea, I had no objective of winning a Nobel Prize whatsoever. Um, when I worked it out in yeast, and of course other people were also working, I mean, particularly Lee Hartwell on this, I realized that was an important problem, um, which we'd solved in yeast, but I, I think I thought it was likely to be helpful for thinking about other organisms, but I didn't fully expect it to be highly conserved. But I did think it was sufficiently possible to do the experiment that Melanie Lee did. Now, it took us a couple of years to do it, but once we had that result, I realized this was a very significant result because it was now not only relevant for yeast, but relevant for nearly all eukaryotes, not for prokaryotes, but for all eukaryotes. And it took the world by complete surprise. You know, you know when you publish a big paper, you know often you know, there's lots of reviews of it and they appears in the newspapers, you know, like stem cells that are always out there. Nobody reported this at all, completely um, silent. And um, it took about two years for people to realize quite what it meant. And by that time, the story was over and I knew that if they were ever, that A, it was important enough possibly to win the Nobel Prize, and secondly, um, that um, because it took so long for people to realize it, that we were in a strong position. Then the next thing that happened is I started winning other prizes which are precursors for the Nobel Prize, because there's a whole series of prizes, like the Lasker Award and, and, and so on. And then I did realize that it was possible. And then a very irritating thing started to happen. Journalists began to phone me up the day before the Nobel Prize was announced. Um, and that happened for about three years before I uh, did win it, asking, did I think I would win it next, th the next day? And I, I used to just tell them to bog off, actually. <laughs> but, um, the, um, but that was extremely irritating. But that did happen. So I did know I was being considered. I suppose. It wasn't a complete surprise. Paul, let me ask you just one follow-up. Yeah. Be honest. Did you sleep well the night before the Nobel Prize <laughs> announcement <laughs> every year as it, you won? You know, I, I wasn't thinking about it till the bloody journalists phoned me up and then I wouldn't sleep the night. You're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> and all right, I'll tell you, can I tell you another story about that? Because the, the year I won it, um, I was watching out for it and nobody phoned me and I thought, okay, not happening. So I went for a meeting um, where I was fundraising for Mendel's monastery. He, Men, Grigor Mendel did his work on genetics in um, Bruno in the Czech Republic. And I went to a meeting actually with Jim Watson of Watson and Crick um, because we were both trying to raise money for, um, for it. And um, this was um, 2001, of course. And because I'm um, over 50, I don't, I keep my mobile phone switched off, you know? <laughs> you know, people under 50 keep it on, people over 50 <laughs> keep it switched off. And um, I had a message when I was in this meeting, my office phoned me and said, could I switch on my mobile? And so I went out and switched on my mobile and um, I had a recorded message from Sweden and I couldn't understand it because, it, um, <laughs> and I thought it was a journalist again asking me to comment on who had won the Nobel Prize that year. And so I then listened to it again and then I realized actually they were telling me I'd won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and then I realized when I listened to it for a third time that my friend Tim Hunt had won it too. So um, that, that's, that's, what, that's what happened. Then I went back to my office and I phoned up my friend Tim Hunt and he said, I, I can't believe, this isn't true, he said. And I've looked at the website, and it's not up there. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, nobody's going to play a hoax on you, surely. 
And um, he said, well, I don't believe it. And then we were both talking on the phone, and then it came up on the website. So then we had to believe it. Yeah. <laughs> if it's on the website, it has to be true, after all. Yeah. Thank you. That's a nice story. Another question. Yes, there's one here. Please. Uh, thank you for the interesting and very inspiring talk. Uh, I actually taught a class called Nobel Prize 100 years this semester, so I'm sure many of my students are in the audience today. And we happened to talk about your work ah. uh, actually last night. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> and <Yes. laughs> it's really an honor to see you in person here today. So I want to ask you a question for my students and yes. also young scientists like myself. Uh, from your own experience, uh, what do you think is the most uh, important quality for scientists to get success in research? Yeah, it's a good question. So what is the most important quality? There are a number of qualities, but I'll tell you what I think is essential, and that is a curiosity about how the world works. Because unless you're curious about how the world works, a passionate curiosity, in fact, you can never keep going through the long times that you have to spend doing this and how all the failures you have to experience. Some of you will be graduate students in here and the audience, and you know that your experiments fail all the time. I mean, you just know it. And you think it's you, but it isn't you. It just is if you're doing something which is at the cutting edge, it will fail often. And unless you have a passion, a curiosity for knowing the answer, it's very difficult to keep going in those circumstances. So that's the one thing I'd identify, curiosity. Uh, hello, Professor Nurse. Um, I've got a question. Um, there's a saying among my friends that only rich people do researches. Um, they, 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 have, they don't have any financial pressure or something else. Um, most of us uh, ordinary people should care more about making money, yep. uh, not doing research. Yep. So I'm confused, so I want to hear your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at my shoes. I'm not very rich, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, well, you know, if you want to be rich, that's good. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Um, I personally am not too bothered about it. Um, um, I, I think it's nice to have enough money to live. And you heard my stories. I was saying I was a bit worried when I was younger because I had no job. So obviously, um, having um, a salary being paid is a good idea. But it is true, if you're going to be a research scientist in a university, you're probably never going to be very rich. That is true. But you are going to, if you can do it well, get a lot of satisfaction. So you just have to make your decisions. Do you want to be rich? Maybe you can be satisfied with that too. But um, working in a university, following your curiosity, allowing the freedom to work on um, almost what you like, not quite, but almost what you like, is a great privilege. And so I would always go for that privilege over earning a lot of money. Thank you. Pass the mic. It's good, we're going up the hill. It's nice. So thank you very much for Hello. your speech. Uh, I am a student that in China, we, I am a medical student. Yep. So, uh, uh, I have a low, I have very, not, not too much knowledge about this biochemistry. Yeah, so I want to get some suggestions. Just like our students in Chinese, in China, we have to study medical, uh, medical, we have a lot of course to study in the, in the hospital and in the, in the school. Yep. And how to ask, make the balance of the science study and the clinical study? Yeah, so um, that, that's a good question too. It's not just in China, by the way. All medical students um, <laughs> throughout the world have to study intensely and learn lots of um, information. Um, I have um, medically trained students who work doing a PhD in my laboratory. I have one at the moment. I've had about five or six in my life. And um, I think it's really a question for you. 
Um, you get a fantastic training as a medical student. You understand also what is important for human beings. And you can apply your knowledge to understanding basic problems in biology that will be relevant to biomedicine and medicine. And if that interests you, then you can then learn, after you've done your medical degree, how to be a scientist as well. And I think that's um, a very good thing to do. And I try and encourage people just like you um, to um, actually uh, think about doing science. It's not for everybody. It's actually only probably for a small number. But those who come into science with a medical background can contribute a great deal. So I know it's a problem, and it's difficult to do in your medical studies. You can do a little bit of it, but think about it when you finish your medical studies. And then if you're no good at the science, you can always go back to be a doctor again. So you can, you can have a job as well. Back here. There was somebody. Yeah, yeah, if you pass the microphone back to the lady in blue. Uh, hello, Dr. Paul. Hello. Uh, it's my first time to communicate uh, a Nobel Prize honor, so I'm so excited. Uh, my heart beats so fast. I'm excited uh, to be here. And too. I but want speak to. Speak slowly. Speak slowly. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so nervous. Uh, I want to ask two questions. Uh, first one, first one, one is uh, what kind of food do you like? Do you like Chinese food? <laughs> uh, yesterday. Do you know, last. Yeah. No, yes, last night. We had the most amazing meal in Beijing. What, what was the name of the... Um, did, did you get, get that? that? <laughs> this was an amazing uh, Chinese restaurant, which I think was an old imperial palace, is that yes. right? Yes. And uh, so it's very traditional. Um, a one, it was like wandering into a cinema set. Do you know the film Raise the Red Lantern? Do you know... You know Oh, what's that in Chinese? God knows. <laughs> it was just like that. Just like that. And the food was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I really like Chinese food. In England, we have had traditionally a strong contact with Hong Kong, of course. And um, so we have much um, Cantonese um, cooking in England. And I have almost next door to me in Oxford a Sichuan restaurant too. I'm always eating Chinese food. It's great. One of the great cuisines in the world with French cooking and Chinese cooking. Uh, just, just now you said uh, that uh, we, uh, our people, uh, our students now just download some papers. We didn't read it, no. just download it. So, uh, what kind of book uh, do you want to recommend us to read it? And uh, which book uh, influenced you most in your life? Well, well I, think, um, I'll, I think it's very important to read these papers. Sometimes um, they're not always written brilliantly, so I do understand that. But it's very important to read outside the area that you're actually researching in, if you're a researcher. Because one of the great um, problems with being a researcher is that your mind runs on a railway track. Once you've started thinking in a certain direction, it's very difficult to change direction. And reading papers is one way of changing direction. So what I do with my students, I read, um, let's say, nature and science, and I read anything in there. I'll read about dinosaurs, I'll read about um, modeling climate change. I'll read about um, evolution, ecology. And if there's something I think is interesting, even if it's irrelevant, I rip the, I, I, I have a subscription, I rip the, pa the uh, paper out and I give it to my students to read. Now, I'm not sure they really read most of them, to be quite <laughs> honest with you, but they read some of them because it escapes the, the normal reading. So I think that's very important. Second question you asked me was, um, what influenced me. And you know, there's some fantastic papers. Two periods are really interesting. One will surprise you. It's the 19th century. These great papers uh, that people like Darwin wrote, I mean, the books, they are beautifully written. And they explain um, uh, biological phenomena like evolution by natural selection, which is just wonderful, and it's literature. So I really enjoy reading those papers. That will surprise you, perhaps. But more, um, uh, uh, more relevant 
is the, all the papers around the birth of molecular biology and molecular genetics. <laughs> Authors like Sidney Brenner and Francis Crick. These are amazing papers, some of them, and it, they're just brilliant, and I enjoy reading those too. So that's my two, two areas. Thank two you. areas. <laughs> yep, we have someone here, We're part of our floor audience. Great. Uh, Interesting you. hat you have on there. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, uh, my name is Zhu Shai, a student from Nursing College, and yeah. I, I have two questions to ask you. Right, one at a time, please. <laughs> yes, and the first one, um, and uh, you use uh, the yeast, uh, and uh, do you think there is a close relationship between the yeast and the human being cells? Yeah, so the question is the relationship between yeast and humans. Well, with respect to their cell cycle, yes, because that's why I got a Nobel Prize, basically, okay? Um, I think the basic properties of cells and how they work, there are many similarities. But humans' cells, of course, do many more things that yeast cells do not. You know, they made you. You have a nose, you have eyes, you have toes, you have fingers. Uh, yeast don't have They don't have that. And so if you're interested in development um, and all the things that come with that, then, of course, yeast is not a good model. But if you're interested in how cells work, yeast is a good model. Second question. Second question. Okay. And uh, uh, I think your study have pushed forward the study of the cure of carcinoma, cure of cancer. Yep. Yep. And uh, so uh, if you control the abnormal uh, uh, cell reproduction, and will you control the, uh, the normal cell uh, reproduction, like yep. red blood cell and other cells? Now, uh, um, people often ask me how important it is for cancer. My answer is this, that um, without understanding this and the cyclin-dependent kinases, you don't think well about the problem of cancer. But I don't think a cure for cancer will come from this work, and the reason for it is as follows, that what I described here is the mechanism that is common to all cells, whether cancerous or whether not cancerous. So if we target these sorts of enzymes, they're not likely to be specific. So I've always argued that they shouldn't, it, it wouldn't be that important for therapy. But having said that, in recent years, drugs have been, probably even in AstraZeneca, um, have been uh, devised in different pharmaceutical companies which do target these enzymes. I wasn't involved in any of this. And it turns out although I always predicted I didn't think it would be relevant, that combined with other therapies, it does look as if it's important for certain cancers. So once again, I've been proven wrong, and um, this looks as if it may be useful. So I'm sure that it's important for the theoretical understanding of cancer, and just possibly it may be useful for the practicality of cancer too. But I didn't think it would be. Okay? okay? Yes, I'm very interested about how to control the uh, cancer cell. Well, if you know how to control it, you'll, it'll be a very good thing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your answer. One back here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paul, for, uh, for your lecture. And uh, I'm going to ask two uh, personal questions. Yep. Yep. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, I know uh, that uh, you have gone through a long way, and uh, you are even older than my father. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm just uh, curious: Have you ever have a moment to want to give up? And, uh, and do I want if, to give up? Is and uh, how do you overcome this? And uh, what do you really do to deal with these situations? Well, I'm sure I'm older than your father. Looking at you, yes. <laughs> um, but um, um, do you know, I don't want to give up. I, 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 you know, it's a bit like a drug, really. I've been doing it so long, I can't imagine doing anything else. Um, I do do other things, and, um, but I still have my own laboratory. I still have students and um, uh, other people working with me. I can't imagine not doing it. So 
I'm getting a bit worried about it. Does it mean I'm very strange? Not, Maybe at, all. Not at all. You're in good company. I mean, if you think of R Rita Levy Montalcini, another Nobel laureate, yeah. she was still directing her institute in Rome when she was 100, so you've got a way to go yet. Yes, yes it's, it's true. true. <laughs> I'm, uh, just, just a, a, a young, young chicken, chicken, it's true. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I just heard that you, you, you know, once you throw your work into the trash, and I mean, this situation have ever happened, and uh, what do you, you really like to do to, you know, to get more energy to go up? My, uh, you mean, where do I get the energy or where do I get the luck? Yeah, yeah you re regain and uh, I mean, maybe... Do you know, I am quite energetic, it's true, actually. Because um, these guys are working me so hard, I mean, um, and I'm still speaking here. Um, I, 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 I actually wonder why I'm so energetic, actually. I, I, I'm, it is true I am, and um, I can't quite work out why, exactly. But I'm... Um, I had the, a nickname. Do you know what Duracell? Have you heard of Duracell bunnies here? Yeah, the Duracell is a battery, an electrical battery. And the battery runs like, there's a saying in English, a, a, a toy. You put batteries in a toy and then they jump around and <laughs> flap the thing. And the, my lab called me a Duracell bunny, Duracell rabbit, because I'm constantly jumping about. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and uh, yeah. my uh, thank you. And my second question I is. I your third, third question, question, but maybe. <laughs> 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 and, uh, uh, I know you got the Nobel Prize, yeah, and uh, yeah. but I'm still curious. What's your plan for the next uh, maybe one decade or two decades? Or do you have any goals to realize? Any more goals? <laughs> well, I'm not going to win another one. I'm pretty sure of that. <laughs> um, that's, uh, though I did know somebody who did, Fred Sanger, actually, who helped me sequence. Um, my first gene. Um, I, I think I'm setting up a new institute in London, which will, um, the way we will work, will combine my experience on running things like this over 25 years. And I think that's a goal to get that going because I, it won't be typical, it won't be normal, and I have an opportunity to do that. And um, so I think that's probably my major um, thing that I need to achieve. But at the same time, I want to work with my laboratory because it keeps you, you know, I, I'm near, I sometimes say, you know, it's like I'm near the coal face. You're near the, where, the, where things work. And if you're there, you understand things so much better. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, more, oh, well, just here, just, just next to you. Speak into Paul's microphone. Uh, you can. <laughs> I don't know which microphone it is, though. I'm just covered with microphones. <laughs> Perhaps we're going to sing a song together. No. <laughs> just, just, just put it. I'm sure it'll work. Hello, Dr. Nurse. Get, just keep speaking. Uh, uh, I'm on. I'm a flash in this field, and uh, I uh, started my experiment just uh, six months ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing Western blotting now. You're doing Western blotting? Blot? Yes. yes. Uh, I repeated it about 20 times. Uh, but it doesn't <laughs> work. <laughs> but uh, I have no confidence with my result. Ah, uh, mm. My question is where does the confidence come from? Ah. Repeating or something else? Well, you know, it's not unhealthy not to be completely confident. You're worried because you're not confident. But if you get too confident too quickly, that's a problem, a bigger problem than building up your confidence. So the fact that you lack confidence now, don't worry about it, keep doing it, and your confidence will get better. The people who have a real problem are those who start with confidence and then actually never learn thereafter. So don't worry about it, keep going, and it will work. More questions? Just somebody just here? A very inspiring talk. So, uh, so after your talk, I, I noticed that we have at least two things in common. First, I do not like washing dishes either. Mm. Second, you said that uh, you were short of money when you started your lab. Yep. Uh, I just started my lab uh, half a year ago, so probably that's also my case. So I, I noticed that you are always work. Uh, of course, your work is on some very fundamental research. So I think that now 
not only in China, a lot of governments are putting more investigation into translational studies. I'm not saying that translation is, a translational study is not important. I mean that um, a lot of fundamental research is have a, probably far-reaching implications like your research, right? So I think, so, so what's your comment on this issue? I mean, the science policy issue? Yeah, I, I think that microphone may not be I'm working not, anymore, but... I'm basically a comment on translational research yeah. and the move towards funding translational research. Yeah, so the, what the question was about, because I'll just repeat it, because I think the mic may not be working. I'm not quite sure. Um, the question is about the balance, really, between... Um, what I prefer to call discovery research and translational research, that is, for, um, for usefulness. Now, translational research is very important. Um, it is also quite difficult to do. And um, I think that um, if you put too much pressure on people to do translational research to get to certain goals, um, it can be difficult because people... If you're looking at a particular objective over here and you're a long way away from it, it can be very, very difficult to get to it. Um, if, if you work in the pharmaceutical industry, for example, they will start much closer to the problem. And, and the mistake is made by some of our scientific leaders to push people into translational research from positions where it's very, very difficult to do. So my... my response to you is that um, translational research should be supported strongly when it is likely to work, but pushing people to do it from positions where they're too, they don't have the, uh, the knowledge base to be able to do it properly is really, really stupid. And I see too many of my, um, um, too many people in positions of responsibility who simply don't understand that. And I can have some influence on that in Britain and will and do and I have some influence through the university but um, I think we've got to be uh, much more sophisticated in our thinking about it. Thank you. We haven't got too much time left so okay one question here but then I'd, somebody at the back we'd like a question from so carry on yes, please. Okay uh, so thank you so much for a talk I think most of us uh, from your talk know doing Doing things to explain simple phenomena can get the Nobel Prize. My first question is, I know that you share the prize with the other two persons, right? Yep. One is Leland... Uh, Leland Hartwell and Tim yeah, Hunt. So yeah. I forgot the, the name of the other one. Could you please give us a brief introduction in terms of what they have done and any correlations of their discovery with your work. Yes, yes so, so I can qu quickly summarize what um, they've done. I just talked about my contribution. Uh, Tim Hunt um, identified cyclin, and he did that working also in a very basic research way. He was working on marine organisms, sea urchins and um, the like, and showed that as early embryos divided, a protein was accumulating and then being degraded. And um, he made that discovery and it related completely to the work that I was doing. What Lee Hartwell did was to start genetic analysis of the cell cycle. He didn't um, uh, take the discovery through to um, identifying the CDK as a protein kinase and all of that, but he showed how it could be done. So he showed how it could be done. He inspired me to take that forward and then Tim took a more biochemical approach and I took a genetical approach. So that sums it up. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so what kind of projects your lab is conducting for the time being? We do sort of three things really. Uh, one is, I mean, we sequence fission yeast, I think I said that, we deleted all the genes. So we're using genomics and system biology approaches to identify all the components required in the cell cycle to expand beyond the controls that we know already. So that, that, that's one thing. The second thing is, which is, um, I'm interested in how cells determine their shape. And we I, have isolated a number of genes and, uh, and worked on the process there. How a cell has a sense of how big it is, its shape, and its dimensions. All th these sorts of questions are ones that we're now asking in the lab as well. So genomic cell cycle, cell shape, and dimensions. Okay, another question, but 
Let's, we go. Who wants to ask a question at the back? There's somebody right at the back. There we go. Please. Yep. Hi. Hello. Uh, I want to ask you two questions here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you want to uh, ask one? Uh, yeah, I'm There's sorry. Two questions. Oh, yeah. Maybe what, what, what one question one. is okay Make for it me? one, okay. because Make then we one. can ask somebody else. Yeah, one. So, you know, um, uh, this is the first year for me to be the master's student here. And, you know, after one month, we will go to the library to do some experiments. So do you have any suggestions for the students like me, who will just uh, go to the library to do experiments here? So I think your question was, um, let me just see if I've got it clear. Any advice for students starting laboratory work? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So the first thing you should appreciate is doing laboratory work is not easy. And um, it quite often doesn't work first time, as we were hearing. Um, and uh, you shouldn't be dismayed by that. People usually think that they have made a mistake and it's a big problem. And it's, it's like cooking. You have to learn cooking, Chinese food, back to Chinese cooking. And you have to learn how to do it. You have to have fingers that learn how to do it. You can only do that with experience. So my real um, advice is keep going, keep trying, try and um, uh, learn how to be careful with the experiment so that you, you make sure every step is, is right. But don't get dismayed when it doesn't work, because usually eventually it does. So just keep going and be careful and don't get depressed. Okay? Right. One more over there, yeah? So thank you very much to, help, to let me have the chance to ask you any question. So as we know, the knowledge, they are booming and just like uh, volcano eruptions. Yeah, so I want to, uh, so uh, when facing this so many knowledge and uh, such as uh, papers, published every day or every year. And uh, here comes the question is, uh, for especially the young uh, scientist, how could we, what should we do and how could we choose the best, uh, the most promising field, such as genes to investigate yeah. or spend all energy of, or effort? So I think the question is about how a young scientist should choose the field and what they should be doing and how they should be doing it, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm often asked this question and um, I usually, first of all, say two things. It's very difficult um, to predict the future. Um, and if you are going to predict the future, you shouldn't ask old men like me, um, <laughs> because uh, we are not the best people to think about it. I say a second thing is that too often, young scientists are looking at what is popular today in the journals, and usually, by that time, it's already too late to follow that um, study because if it's very popular, there's many people working with it and it just won't work. So you have to think about things that are actually not being worked on very much now but which are important for the future. I'm not saying that's easy. I'm only saying you can't simply look at what's working well now because by that time, there's many, many people working on it, and you'll find it difficult, even stressful, um, to work. Second thing I would say, which is um, a little different, is you have to work on something that is interesting to you. You know, so don't think about it too mechanically. Work on something that interests you. And don't worry about the world so much. If it interests you and it's important, you will make the world realize that it's important. And so don't um, just try and follow everybody else. Try and work out what you can do yourself. So I think that's the two, two things I'd think about in choosing the future. <coughs> it's been great. Thank you very much. Great questions. Really good.